Hello everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this Thursday afternoon program. I'm Dylan Ryder from the Johnson County Library. We have the privilege to be joined by Karen Sillens from A Plus Career and Resume, who will be talking about building your career portfolio. Some quick, quick information about our presenter. Karen Sillens is a multi-certified and award-winning career and business coach. Karen provides resume writing, career and executive coaching, and small business coaching to clients in Kansas City and throughout the U.S. and Canada. Karen has held a membership in the prestigious Forbes Coaches Council since 2016, was chosen as one of 38 career experts to watch in 2018 on Twitter, and is rated as a top social media influencer for employment, human resources, and recruitment on Audiolience. She res resides in Kansas City, Missouri with her husband Andrew and their four rescue dogs. Feel free to add your comments and questions in the chat to participate in our discussion. Karen will attempt to address each question at different points throughout the, uh, the presentation. The contents of the program will be recorded for future viewing. So again, thank you so much. And here's Karen. Thank you, Dylan. So I want to let everybody know who's watching this. I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm here to give you information you can use immediately. Today, we're gonna to be talking about creating a career portfolio. And a career portfolio is something that will set you apart from the competition when you get into your interview. It can also even be helpful within the context of a phone interview and networking. And we're gonna talk about how it's not something you just do once, it's something that's ongoing, it will serve you ongoing. It is a visual presentation. <clears throat> you will have something like this in your hand <laughs> when you go in and it'll be sitting in your lap. So it's that traditional um, leather bound, except I would go for fake leather. It stands up better. Um, it's, it's like a, a three ring binder inside. It has the three rings and we'll actually take a look at it a little later to see what mine looks like a little bit. And it's important because you have everything encompassed in one item, not I have three or four notebooks and I can't find anything I'm trying to refer to, or I just have a pad of paper and I'm taking notes. And some people don't even go into an interview and take notes. They come in with nothing and that's a huge mistake. Now you're ahead of the curve because not only do you have your resume and your cover letter in front of you that you sent to this organization that you can answer questions about directly by looking at it, but you also have other information to help you and that includes the creation of some behavioral interviewing answers, which we are gonna talk about how you do that. Another thing is it helps you see the scope of your professional and volunteer experience and allows you to have some promotion of it. Sometimes people will ask to see your portfolio after or during the interview, and we'll talk about how to handle that. It definitely constantly evolves. You will not create this once, and never use it again. You can use it for interviewing. You can use it for phone interviewing as well, not just on-site interviews or video interviews, but those phone interviews. You can also use it for networking. And that's hugely important because when you go into a networking situation, people don't want you to hand them a giant resume of you know, all your stuff, but they'll look at a portfolio and it'll be rather impressive to them and they'll be thinking, wow, I should do one of these. So it can be a real way to open up a conversation and you're kind of like that expert to them for that moment on how they can create one too. Here, let's look in mine and see what I did. That's always a good starter in a conversation. Then there's also the impact of promotions and performance reviews. Every year you go into your performance review and you're like, oh, what? thing that I messed up will you remember and you won't remember any of the good stuff I did all year. If you can write down things that you've done ahead of time throughout the year that benefited the company, specifics, not just overall I did this, but some specifics on what you've done and have it with you in your portfolio and we'll talk about how to arrange that here in a minute, similar to the behavioral interview information that we'll be talking about. You have an arsenal with you of information to overcome the negative that they may be trying to utilize to lower your raise <laughs> and companies will do that and that can be the 
benefit to you of turning that around and say maybe the company was going to give out somewhere between 1% and 5% to everybody and they were going to try to use just one thing that you know was a mistake during the year and it wasn't even that big of a deal to lower your raise to 2%. But because you brought in proof of the value you are to the organization, they raised it to 3.5. That's the difference it can make. So let's not think, oh, I'm only going to use it for a job interview, then I'm going to set it aside and never use it again. This is something that you can continually use. It's also a good career manager. Sometimes you're starting to look through your portfolio and it's kind of like looking through an old photo album and you go, you know what, I should have taken a picture that one time when I was at this park. I forgot to do that. Same thing with your career portfolio. You know what, I'm missing this area or I need to have an answer for that question next time. It gives you the ability to prepare ahead of time and think about these things ahead of time, which makes you much more um, confident when you walk into any sort of situation like an interview or networking. And it's a wonderful introduction. When you're able to sit down, say at lunch with somebody, someone who a person that you know has set you up with to learn about their company, maybe they're hiring, that kind of stuff, what a wonderful thing to bring a portfolio to the lunch and let them look through it. They're not being handed a resume. You're not trying to get them with a business card and business cards are good. I, I'm a big believer in those that you create for yourself. But still, there's something about having that portfolio that just creates that additional interest that you won't have otherwise. Now, how we get started in creating a portfolio is very simple. First, get that resume out. You have experience that's on there that you may want to talk about in more detail in answering some behavioral questions and also in how you showcase some information, say a volunteer activity. For instance, I was just talking to someone today who helped arrange a golf tournament every year. And I said, if in your portfolio you ever want to put a picture of you at the golf tournament, you know, this isn't a scrapbook, but this is showing, hey, here I am professionally, and you're showing people, this is what I've been doing, this is how I've been creating it, and making sure that people understand, I can not only do my job, but I can create an event for you. I can do all kinds of extra stuff that you wouldn't have even thought of. And it looks great because you're also saying, I'll volunteer for the company. And a lot of companies love to have the volunteer ism going on and that's a big help to them then there's also other things that you've done that sometimes you're able to share that were for the company a marketing plan but you take certain information out you only show certain things and we may even black out just a little bit of information so we don't give away any competitive advantage detail or who the customer is but you can still include some of that we don't put an entire marketing plan in there. We don't put a paper we published and put the whole thing in there unless it's just a couple pages. We put small excerpts of things in there so people can see we have the ability to do this. The advantage of that is we're giving them enough information to see that we have this ability, but not so much information that we're giving away freebies to the company. And we will talk about that. There's all kinds of things on this initial list a lot of these wind up being on, of course, your resume. Now, certainly something that has to do with interesting hobbies is probably not going to be on your resume. But one of my friends, for instance, for many, many years was a competition flyer. She did all those aerial acrobats and the biplane type of person. And you would never expect this from her, but yet she could definitely use this in her portfolio. And it would be a fabulous addition for her to have. Sometimes your hobbies are just interesting and unique enough, say a ballroom dancer or somebody who does something very interesting on the side that does relate to them actually uh, as their work. For instance, a pilot, a traditional pilot. How many sales companies would love to have a pilot that can get a hold of a plane and fly them places? That makes you valuable. So it's those little things sometimes you're sharing that also create additional interest in them wanting you as an employee. So what we're doing is we're building up that extra information that they're going to know about us to make us a more saleable candidate. 
So now you see that there's a list below that list and it says examine the 50 most valued transferable skills for new job or career. And this is from ExecuNet. I did not create this list. I cannot claim any sort of creation to this list. However, it's one of the best lists I've ever seen of competencies any company would want. And it's on page one and on to page two. So there's a ton of them. The reason that I love this list, beyond the fact that it's so useful, is it's diverse. You cannot possibly anticipate every question they're gonna ask you in an interview. But if you take traditional competencies that a company would want, combine those with the different questions that you think you might be asked, that can create a big group of answers that you could have in the middle of an interview. And it gives you a lot of confidence walking in. Now people will say to me, oh, I can't put answers in something and take that to an interview, that's cheating. No, cheating is breaking into their office three days before your interview and stealing their interview questions. This is preparation. And in the 15 years I've been using this particular method with my clients, never once has a client told me that in any way this has cost them a job, that people thought they cheated or anything. It's always, wow, they were so interested in my portfolio, they wanted to see it afterwards. And I even have two clients that got hired on the spot because of this very exercise that they'd done that was in their portfolio. I'm not saying that's gonna to happen to you, that's two out of a whole lot of clients over the years, but still, that's a pretty nifty thing to have happen to you, that you would be hired based on what they saw from some prep that you've done. So let's look at six of these that are on the list that cause people some problems because they're not quite sure what to do with it. First of all, I'm gonna tell you how you're gonna quote unquote answer these put a question and this is something you'll write down yourself right now or type into your phone or, or however you want to do it a question that you can insert one of the 50 in easily and that question is tell me about a time you used blank and then put a blank in your work in your volunteer work or in school and only put the in school part if you recently graduated other than that, it's just work and volunteer. Because work is work whether you get paid for it or not. And sometimes you have wonderful experiences in your volunteer or your professional organizations that you've done it, uh, stuff for, which is always gonna be volunteer. And you would want to actually let people know about that. You wouldn't wanna hide it, but you may not remember it in the middle of an interview. Then what we're gonna do is create our answers using an acronym. And that acronym is CAR. And you're also going to write that down, just like the car that you drive. And that stands for challenge, action, and result. Again, that's challenge, action, and result. Every behavioral slash performance slash situational slash competency-based interview question that you can get can be answered with the challenge you faced, the action you took, and the result you achieved. You don't need star, you don't need C star, you don't need 14 letters. Three letters works and it works the best to create these. If you do that, it will make a big difference in how you interview because you won't wander off in the weeds over here someplace while you're trying to give an answer. Because sometimes while we're in the middle of thinking of something, all of a sudden we go, did I feed the dog this morning? And now our mind goes wandering or we're trying to communicate something but we're missing that one word and we can't figure out what it is this kind of avoids that whole issue in car you're just going to write a sentence for the challenge you faced a sentence for the action you faced or action that you took and a sentence for the result you achieved and unless they ask you a negative question and you can find those all over the inter internet if you want to like tell me about a time you didn't handle a situation appropriately at work keep your results positive sometimes people just automatically go to negative results no one's going to want to hire you with a negative result if they have questions about that where they have the here's our negative outcome that we want you to give us, they'll give that in particular. And while you may wanna create a few of those, go find those questions online and make sure that you have say five of them ready. So now let's talk a little bit about 
how we're going to do this with the six one, six of them that I want to use as an example. So three of them are together. That's wonderful. Four, five, and six. Four is building talent resources. Every one of you has trained someone before, most likely. Training is building talent within the organization. But people often don't see it that way. They think this is something where you have to go and do this fabulous program or something. No, one on one training can count. Even better if you've done cross functional training, meaning that if someone else is missing in the department, there's other people that can take over that function for that day. The companies that got in trouble a lot during the last economic downturn. They did a lot of this. They let go of people who were what we call one trick ponies. However, those one trick ponies hadn't trained anybody else in how to do their job. And then they let them go and they had no one to take care of hugely um, impactful jobs, things on taxes, government compliance. <laughs> That's very bad. We don't want to go into uh, that kind of situation and go, oh, we're sorry. The person who used to do this is gone and now we're going to need three years of training for the next person to do it. Instead, if you create cross functionality and you can show that in an example, that even makes you more valuable as far as building talent within the company. Most organizations do not want you siloed. They want you to build across the team. Next is that change innovation one, number five. People have heard of change management, but they often don't think about change innovation. Change innovation is where you or you in a group actually create or conceive of a change in the organization. This isn't about managing the change, this is about creating the change. It may not be a dramatic change, it may be a simple policy within the department, or it may be something that impacts the entire organization. It does not matter, either is fine. And that's the problem a lot of people think, oh, you know, I haven't done anything very impressive. Think about committees you've served on, small groups you've been involved in. Any of this can make a difference in that you usually create something along the way. Even for something that is more project management uh, wise, for instance, it could be just in creating the project plan to get things going, something new, something different. It's something that's new to the organization. It doesn't have to be life changing. Then change management, number six, is managing a change. Typically, by managing a change, they mean you get other people in the organization to go, yes, that change is good, we should do that. That's called creating advocacy. People will sometimes say, well, but I'm not a manager. I don't know what I do with that since I'm not a manager. Well, here's the thing. Most people that manage things aren't always given a management title, are they? But they're still managing processes. Sometimes they're supervising people when a boss is out of the office. There's change management that sometimes goes on within the context of that management. That's where we talk about managing the change. Instead of saying, ooh, I had responsibility for this whole company. If you did, that's great. We're gonna talk about that too but it doesn't have to be just an HR or organizational development area or a high level executive. Employees that have no managerial title whatsoever are often heavily involved in change management. And it may be because you're the person that's advocating for your boss on the change. That can be included in change management. Next is number 17, and that is diversity acumen. We want to think about this as diversity within the United States. This is different socioeconomic levels. This is just the simple difference between men and women. This is a difference between sexual orientation. It can be uh, race, religion, and you name it. That's a difference. There is something very different between you and another person. And that it doesn't matter that they're different from you you can deal with them just as effectively as you deal with anybody else. One of the big things a lot of my clients tend to use is the socioeconomic difference. And sometimes that's as simple as, I know the janitor's name and I know the executive's name. A lot of people have heard those stories in college where the college professor asked 
for you to actually give the name of the janitor uh, for a test something they had mentioned several times oh there's janine here in the you know auditorium today you know she's doing a great job cleaning up and he said that probably 10 or 15 times during class and yet people have never bothered to notice but it's a test question so it's a good thing to know how to deal effectively with anybody across all levels of an organization and that's what diversity acumen really is all you're going to do is give an example of you dealing with somebody who's different from you and it was effective the outcome was good next is financial acumen that will be number 20. a lot of people think oh, i didn't manage any big budgets or anything yes but did you forecast towards a budget did you give any numbers towards that budget did you ever work in a retail environment where you had to actually take cash from people, take their credit cards, make sure everything was balanced at the end of the night? Did you ever work in a bank? A lot of admins wind up doing petty cash. If you can't manage $200, you can't manage thousands of dollars, and you certainly can't manage millions. So it doesn't matter whether it's a small amount, or it's a big amount, it's more about showing you have the ability, which is what essentially acumen means, the skill to handle it. Whether it's going to be that $1 million budget or it's going to be the $200 in petty cash, it really doesn't matter. It's that you effectively and accurately either forecasted, managed, or gave it out to people. Next is 23, that's global perspective. Global perspective is very different, difficult for a lot of people. But many of us do deal with people outside of the United States on a regular basis at our company because our company may have, say, a branch that's over in Germany or they may have an IT group that's in China or India or down in South America. There's also the potential that you have manufacturing operations elsewhere in the world. Any of that counts. And as I like to remind people, yes, in America, we speak English. They do not speak all the same English in Canada, England, Australia, or South Africa. So we can't assume that those won't work. Actually, they'll work just fine. It's knowing what not to say and how not to insult somebody. And it's also part of understanding that maybe different cultures handle instructions and how to do a project different from others and catering to or tailoring to their needs as far as how they want a project handled. The last one is actually number 40. And number 40 is quantitative analysis. Quantitative analysis is difficult for a lot of people to wrap their head around. I'm gonna give a very simple explanation example, and then I'm gonna give more uh, higher level. First is if you just want the simplest in quantitative analysis, it's anything that you're counting essentially or measuring that has no monetary value assigned to it at that moment. Inventory is one of the simplest things to use for quantitative analysis. I have 72 of widget A. I have 33 of widget B. I have 10 of widget C. And I have 97 of widget D. That's quantitative analysis. Now, for a higher level of it, your company may have used metrics, key performance indicators, how they established benchmarks, or even Six Sigma. And that would usually be something to do with, say, a Six Sigma black belt level type of project. Any of these other ones, usually you can just look them up online. One of the only other ones I usually get asked about is actually tenacity, and that means a stick to itiveness to get something done. You're tenacious in getting that done. You're the bulldog who bites down and won't let go because the project's not done yet, and you're gonna see it through to the end. That's tenacity. Then you're gonna select some samples for your portfolio. And there's several things here that talk about, you know, things that you can do. For instance, articles you've written, skills and ability statements, maybe you've created or had somebody create for you a bio before, um, achievements, successes, stuff like that. 
And you can start kind of laying some things out. What would you like to keep? Where are things that you might have to black out a little bit of information because your company wouldn't want you to give that away? That kind of stuff. So next we're gonna talk about, because there's a bigger list of things you can put in there right after this, is the supplies, you need to assemble one. First of all, you need a place to keep all your stuff. It won't necessarily be that you use everything you're thinking about in your portfolio at any given time. And things will change out based on what you're doing at that moment. An accordion file, several file folders, or a file box that you can keep your stuff in will benefit you greatly. People often find it difficult to locate things while I'm working with them as a resume writer or a career coach. And one of the reasons they're finding it difficult is because they never kept it together. This allows you to find, here's my performance reviews, here's my awards. One of the things of working with military people and fairly recent military people as well is that they always have what's called an I love me file. And the I love me file has everything in it. And they'll either bring me an accordion file or a giant notebook of all their stuff. It has their performance evaluations in it. It has their awards that they've received. It has every training and development thing they've gone through. It has every piece of paper the military has ever given to them because they're told from the beginning to keep that. And it's actually really good advice. You know, just in case we can't find something, you have proof. Having said that, that doesn't mean that your project management course from 1995 is something you need to keep. You probably don't have a big memory of that. But things from the last seven to 10 years, and certainly awards and things, I would, I would keep. Next is having good paper. You don't wanna be turning a page in your portfolio, and even though we're gonna use, hopefully, sheet protectors, you don't want that paper to be so thin, you know, you can see through it, essentially. You know, at least use the 20 pound. Next is the sheet protectors. You need to go to the store, take them out unless you already have a bunch, and make sure they're anti-glare. Shine them in the light like this. I will guarantee you half the stuff you take out of the box that says anti-glare will not be. But the advantage of having the anti-glare is one, you can obviously see them during your time, but I can't tell you how many stories I've had of the people who were looking at a portfolio after the interview, the interviewers, sticky fingers, spilled coffee onto the portfolio, all kinds of things like that. And because they had the sheet protectors, everything remained dry and protected. Then another thing is divider sheets. I don't like the tabs that you just stick onto stuff because they come off in your hand in the middle of your interview. Instead, get the sheets that have the tab already infused in it. You can always just change out the labels on them. It's not a big deal but you want to make sure that you have the ability to just turn to that area of your portfolio and start talking. If you're gonna put some pictures in there, you can have the choice of using some glue or some post-it tape or something. You may need a three hole punch because your portfolio should have that th the three holes in it. Card stock if you want to quote unquote mount the picture on something attractive and a color scanner or copier. And if you don't have one, you can merely go to someplace like the UPS store or even something like a FedEx store. Um, also, Office Max, Office Depot, and Staples. <laughs> they will all have that. Or see if a friend has one that you can borrow. You're not making 40 copies for your portfolio. You don't want too much information in there. But you want enough, and you want things that are in color, if you can, copied into color again. Then the last thing, the leather bound real or imitation portfolio. So let's see what you can see because I'm obviously looking at my presentation right now. I'm gonna hold this up in front of my face. So now you can see there's the notebook. That's your eight and a half by 11 legal pad. But in the middle, there's these three rings. The three rings are there for a very specific reason. That's the place you put your portfolio. So you can turn to pages easily and then go back to your notes. That's the only two requirements for your portfolio. Whether the portfolio has handles on the outside, whether it's leather or, le or you know, fake leather, or it's that really nice, there's some sort of unusual looking vinyl ones that are out there that are really nice and look very professional. 
or you've got the suede ones or whatever. That does not matter. That's a choice by you. It's what's inside of it then ultimately that matters. Now, sometimes my clients will say, you know what? I know that they're not real expensive, but I haven't found one that's less than say 30 bucks and I really don't want to spend any money right now. I want to save my pennies. Find a three ring binder. Those are cheap or you probably have some at home. Make sure it's clean and everything. And if you can, if it has the little pockets on the inside, that would be even better because you could kind of put your notebook in there, your eight and a half by 11. But if it doesn't, don't worry about it. You can always find usually the ones that have the three holes already punched in it and you can put that in there. Now you've got an effective portfolio. They're not going to be all upset because your portfolio is not leather bound. They don't care. It's the information that's in it and the fact that you've taken the time to prepare that they care about. So now let's talk about what goes in that portfolio. Here's the thing. Recent information is always best. We don't need to share a whole bunch of stuff from 20 years ago. So I have a client currently who has a struggle there. Last so many years, they've been taking care of children. I want to make sure that not all of their stuff goes way back. So not only are we going to leverage volunteer activities, but what I'm going to give him to do going forward. So there's more of a um, dissemination of, it, of information through time instead of everything is 10 years ago or before then, because that could be a problem. If we show that throughout this whole time, and then he has stuff, he has learning and all kinds of stuff he's done that he has little certificates for and everything. If you can show things through time, that's your best bet. But it doesn't mean you need to overload your portfolio because the next thing says quality versus quantity. We don't need 45 different elements in our portfolio. If we have 12 different things, and those include the following, your resume and cover letter, your references, any reference letters or recommendations from LinkedIn, then maybe you also have something that's um, with your degree, for instance. Then you have your challenge action and result examples. Then you have a copy of some awards, a copy of some of the professional development you've done and some volunteer work. That's eight or nine elements right there. That's more than enough. It makes you unique, it sets you apart, but you're not over creating. Put bunches of things in there and have just dozens of tabs and you're never gonna find anything in that portfolio. That list that follows that says items for your portfolio is but some of the things you can have in there. Just because it's on the list doesn't mean you have to have it. For instance, I would never do the mission statement. I don't have that kind of time. And the only reason I have a bio is because I write them for people. You know, you just heard the short one at the beginning of this program. I do those for people, but rarely do I ever have it when I take it to somebody. I don't need to do that. They're already presenting me. I, I'm not worried about it. And when you're going into a company, you don't necessarily need to have that bio with you though it might be handy, say, in a networking situation if you've got one. Performance reviews, though, can be wonderful, and we don't need to put all of them in there. We can put, say, one from very recent, one from five years ago, and one from eight years ago. Shows through time, no matter what, we're a good employee. Or let's say, let's do one from this last year, three years back, and five years back. Make it simple for yourself, so you're not overwhelming yourself with the information you're trying to uh, collect for this. I tell people if all you have is your resume and cover letter, your challenge action and result examples, and then any reference listing and any recommendations that you can get a hold of, that's a perfectly good career portfolio. If nothing else is in there, you can still hop onto your interview online or go to it in person and feel confident. It's not about trying to put everything in there. It's about having the things that you can control and you feel good about so you can have an effective interview. When you go on to page three, you're gonna notice a whole bunch more stuff listed, including artifacts. Remember, recent is best quality over quantity. So when you can get things, maybe you created training materials, but that was over 10 years ago, 
I don't know that I'd worry about it unless that job absolutely requires you to do a lot of training materials. But perhaps they do require you to do emergency preparedness plans and you have one that you've written recently for your company and you can take two or three pages out of without giving away anything that the company wouldn't want you to tell. That's a little different. Maybe you can create your own charts or spreadsheets or something for something you've examined. It's not real. It's kind of like doing a project for school but it allows you to showcase your skills with that particular software. Those kinds of things work very well as well. So it's not always information you're just taking from work. As you work your way down that list though, you notice just below artifacts, it says information to avoid. If your social security number is on your performance reviews or anything else you put in there, let's say you have a transcript from a class recently, get it off of there black it out, cross it out, do whatever you have to do to make it unreadable. Because if you would ever set your portfolio down someplace and lose it, God forbid, you don't want somebody having your social security number. I do make a joke, I'm on YouTube doing it, saying if you have inappropriate hobbies, please don't share that. For instance, if you like to collect Nazi memorabilia, twist ties and cigarette butts, please let that be your little secret. Do not share that with everybody. and if you're in doubt as to whether the hobby is inappropriate, it probably is. So let's not share it. Or it's not something I would share. For instance, I collect angels. I'm not going to put a picture of a bunch of angels in my portfolio. Um, now, if I walk into the interviewer's office and they have angels all over their office, there might be a mention of my love of angels as well. But that's to establish commonality and rapport, not in order to start getting into a giant conversation about angels. Religion and politics, just say no. Unless you're applying in those venues, please do not include them in your stuff. It's not worth it. it always, they always wind up being on the opposite side of you now. Everybody's upset. It, it's not worth it. Inappropriate captions for pictures. I don't think I have to say any more. Please don't do that. And then proprietary information. That's anything that you have from a company or an organization that you've either worked or volunteered for that they wouldn't want everybody else to know about. A lot of times those are financial numbers, client names, and specifics on a project of some sort. But there's all kinds of other things that go into say an RFP or a, a full-on project plan, things like that, that can often be included that may not be an issue for you. For instance, a lot of people create PowerPoints to tell a story of something as they're going through it as to how they're going to do a something new in their department, for instance. There's probably several of those PowerPoint slides that are more appropriate, more than appropriate actually, for you to have in your portfolio where you could take four or five out and say, here, I can actually do these. Now, how is a portfolio used? Well, before we do that, let's answer any questions we have because I did see, see one pop up just a little bit ago. All righty. A web portfolio. So here's the problem with the web portfolio. Anything you put online is easy to take, if you will. Yes, I used air quotes. Um, it's easy to take things sometimes. You want to be careful with people taking your information. If you keep it fairly general, that's fine. But if you really get right down to it, what is LinkedIn? It's an online portfolio is what it is because you can put projects in there and interviews you've had. For instance, I'm going to be adding an interview to that from last week on KSHB TV. It doesn't matter. Just put them in there and then you can have it on LinkedIn and send people to your LinkedIn profile. That's just as good. Now, somebody who's an artist for any, or a creative writer, and I have an artist as a client right now, by the way. That's a little different, and it's a little different type of portfolio. My biggest concern, particularly for anything that's graphic arts or that's writing, is somebody taking it. So only put portions of things on there. Or if you're going to, you know, put a logo, this is who used it, make sure it's got the watermark across it, all that kind of stuff. That's really going to help you because if you've got that watermarked across it, it's hard for them to use it. And that's what we're going for. 
that way on a website you can have some extra samples if you choose to and as it says in the question it doesn't clog up your portfolio with 20 extra samples and that can be nice to send them to for later but they also think you're pretty savvy if you know enough to watermark that stuff but again the writing examples small bits of them don't give away the whole store recent graduation i would clarify is probably in the last five years or so and the other question was nope that's not a question that's pointing out resources so i think we're good all right so off we go to the next part how is a portfolio used always maintain control of this so it's sitting in your lap you're re you're referring to some things in there and then you're going back and you're taking your notes the problem is somebody asks you for something out of it don't just hand them the portfolio because now they're looking for it and they're going oh isn't this lovely i should do one of these myself and they're not paying any attention to you anymore instead either give them that one piece unhook the three rings hand them that one piece or tell them well obviously i'm referring to some things in here right now but you are so welcome to look through this whole portfolio after the interview if that would be okay i've never had a client get no give it to me now or die so at this point i think you're going to be okay if you just hand it over to them at the end and you can even remind them at the end i know you want to see some stuff in my portfolio would you like to take a look now it's amazing the people that have no time for questions will look through a portfolio for 20 minutes because they're like oh, i should make one of these for myself but they're also impressed that you have one i recently had a, a doctor as a client who was an it manager just before he became a doctor and he said the interesting and i know that's an interesting switch there um, but I, he was an it manager at a hospital but he said that the last three people that they hired because he'd only recently graduated all have portfolios in the it department he said the one department where people go i can't possibly have one of those i don't have anything for that they had portfolios with them. And he said, we didn't hire them because they had the portfolio, but we hired them because that was part of what they brought to us to market themselves. It was part of the whole package. They had some of the answers to these questions already there to refer to if they needed them. They had information with them that made them more marketable. It showcased coding skills or whatever they were hiring for at the time. So I can tell you, it does make a difference in people choosing to hire you. Or in some cases, I've had clients who've gotten personal, um, actual emails after interviewing from the head of the department that interviewed them that said, we had to pick this other candidate because of you know, their internal nature and their experience in this position, but we were so impressed with you and your portfolio and that you spent the time preparing like that. We're going to have another position coming up in a month we highly encourage you to apply for it. <laughs> so that can also make a difference. And sometimes that's resulted in another job. Another thing is leave behind packets. Leave behind packets are a big deal because most people who are interviewing you often haven't done a lot of prep and they may or may not have even your resume in front of them. So what you're going to do is get some of those nine by 11 or 10 by 12 packets that are simply the types of things that you have that you use to mail the, the big stuff. You know, they talk about mailing things on flat envelope. That's the flat envelope. You'll also hear them called manila envelopes. <clears throat> you're just putting your papers in there. You're not doing anything fancy with it. So it doesn't matter if you can't find anything but white ones or the brownish ones. It's just fine. First rule, put certain information on the outside of it. For instance, if you have a job that you're applying for at Garmin, you're gonna put your name, the name of the job, and the name of the company, or the name of the company and the name of the job on it. You can write that on the front of it, or if you have handwriting like mine, you're gonna print a label, because nobody should have to read my handwriting. So I would print a label and put it on there. And it's okay, guess what? You, you have an extra folder with you or extra uh, envelope with you at an uh, interview and you think, oh God, now I can't use it. 
let's see if putting another label over it might make it usable at some point. But if not, don't worry about it. Use it for something at home. It's important that we have information with us that sets us apart. Now, everything that they have from other people that have come in for interviewing is eight and a half by 11. You've just given them something that's most likely nine by 12. And it's that much bigger than everybody else's stuff. And in it, there's information, including your resume and cover letter that you sent to them. Don't put the one in for H&R Block for Garmin. And then you also have any reference letters or LinkedIn recommendations. And I mean the actual written out recommendations where they say you're wonderful and can do the job and your reference listing. When you walk in the door, you just hand it to them. And always ask how many people will be interviewing you. Because if there's three people interviewing you, take four or five of those with you. Invariably, extra interviewers come into interviews. Well, we decided to bring in this manager at the last minute. You've got an extra uh, envelope for them. They're gonna be impressed. And sometimes they'll go, oh, you did not have to do that for us. You go, no, that's how I always do things. And, and please, you're welcome to that. You're welcome to that. They don't think a thing of it. They just take it because you didn't hand them a whole bunch of papers. You handed them a container, if you will, with papers in it. Sometimes they like something in your portfolio a lot. And I mean, they're really, really liking it. Or they're, a, oh, I didn't realize this certification exists. Can I make a copy of the certificate so I can go find that certification? Absolutely, let them copy and put it in their packet. Play peekaboo with your portfolio, which sounds kind of funny, but there's a reason for it. You wanna look at things in your portfolio. And that means, hey, I'm referring to my challenge action and result examples, or I'm referring to a project I worked on, or I'm referring to this PowerPoint presentation, or even something in your resume. Then go back to your notes. Don't get so enamored with your own portfolio that you forget to take notes. Notes are very valuable. They allow you to send a good thank you letter, and they also allow you to create a better picture in your mind of what that job will be. If you go on to another interview then with that company, you also have those notes to take with you. It's very handy. Photocopy versus original. I would not put a copy of your original degree in there. I would make a photocopy of it and put it in there. So don't take your originals with you. Make photocopies of any of your documents that are adjunct to your resume and cover letter, and please put those in there as a copy. Your backup copy is that file at home or that set of files or that file box or whatever that you're keeping all your stuff in. Explain portfolio items when necessary. So if you blacked out a section on your performance review, make sure you tell them that that was not something that was, I didn't do my job well that year. That is a specific thing that they were doing. Maybe it was an R&D project, something like that. The company would not want everybody to know about it. It's proprietary to the organization. But you can see that I left where can Karen improve her performance on the job. I left that for you. That's important. That says I'm going to be a person of integrity for you and not give away your information. And they appreciate that very much. Be selective in what you show. Sometimes people almost make a reason to show them things especially when you're in a more creative field, you're very anxious sometimes to show them items or even in say engineering or architecture, which has its creativity to it oftentimes. So people are like, let me show you this robotics thing I did or whatever. Ask them if they wanna see it afterwards. Don't just force it on them. Instead, instead of finding a reason to refer to it, just wait and ask them at the end if they'd like to see it. Then you could even potentially point out, hey, I've got some examples of this in there. And then that may even prompt them to take a look at it. Which leads me to the next, never push your portfolio on somebody. Sometimes people who put a lot of great stuff in their portfolio are like, everyone must see this. So you're trying to push it on them. Instead, don't invade people's spaces. Just ask them if they'd like to see it. 
and please do not be insulted if they don't look at it. I've had plenty of clients who've been hired by people who did not look at their portfolio, but did cite the fact that they noticed they had one later. It does make a difference. They just don't necessarily have to take a look at it. Don't put anything in your portfolio that you don't want everyone else in the whole wide world to view. <laughs> if you have to question that, it shouldn't go in there. And then work the portfolio into your interview. Don't make it the main attraction. The minute you make your portfolio the main attraction of the interview, oftentimes that means you had extra things in there you shouldn't have had in there. I had a client once that went to an interview and he had three marketing plans in his portfolio. And he comes into his next appointment and he goes, Karen, 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 they interviewed me for two hours after the interview about my marketing plans. I think I'm going to get the job. And I'm going, uh, I don't think so. And I had to very delicately say, I think there was a potential there. They were looking for free information because you put the marketing plans in there. And then the light bulb went off and he said, oh my gosh, I made the portfolio the, the point, not me. So don't make the portfolio the point. You are the main attraction of the interview. Please keep it that way. So who should use a portfolio? Everybody. I had somebody stand up at a presentation once years ago when before it was through Johnson County, it was through a, a group called New Landings. And it was hilarious. This lady stood up and she goes, I came here to tell you today how there was no way you could tell me that I could create a portfolio for myself as an IT person. Back to the IT again. But the ironic thing was, is she goes, and you proved me wrong, which made me very happy because if somebody stands up like that in a presentation, you're like, oh boy, what's going on? And that was really nice to hear because I want everybody to understand it doesn't matter if you're working at a fast food restaurant or if you are working in a construction project, or if you're an executive of a Fortune 10 company, you can have a portfolio. Everyone can have one. And it's beneficial to anyone and everyone. What it does is it offers that ability to have those answers ready for you to give in an interview. And if you have to refer to them, it's very simple. You just say something to the effect of, you know, I wrote down several examples of things I've done and I think this one would fit perfectly for the question you ask and off you go. And you don't ever have to say that again. You just refer to something and give the answer. That's why we do the three sentences for the challenge, action, and result. You can very quickly read those, know what you meant to tell them, but you're not offering this paragraph after paragraph of information that you're now re reading verbatim to them. And they do not like that. If instead you're giving them information that's valuable where you can tell them the story yourself, you're just giving yourself the cues to do it. That's a really nice way of being able to offer up a diversity of stories that you wouldn't have otherwise. And it's unfortunate people often get into an interview and there are about four behavioral questions in of tell me about a time when or give me an example of. And guess what happens? The little guy in the back of your head that tells you what to say, he's gone to lunch. And so now you're trying to take those four wonderful answers you've given and recreate them to sound different each time. And interviewers know it because they've done it themselves and they know you're doing it too. You can avoid all of that by spending some time creating some of these challenge action and result examples. Whether you get five done or 50 of them done, it will benefit you. Why should you use a portfolio? It's documented proof of what you say. I said I had a degree. Look, here's the bright, shiny copy of it. I said I had this award, or I did this professional development program, or I have this or that certification. You have proof with you. I said that I created this golf tournament for the company to benefit this organization. Here I am handing the check and a picture to that organization. Boom. You're proving the things you tell them. I said I can do PowerPoint displays. Here's five slides from a recent one I did. You're offering them that documentation of your skills, as opposed to I'm just saying that I can do things. The number one thing a person thinks when you walk into an interview, and I've asked HR people this, I've asked hiring managers this, and I've asked high-level executives, what's the number one thing you think of when somebody walks into an interview? 
And the number one answer by far is they're going to lie to me. Establish your credibility in that interview. And as time goes on, they don't doubt what you're telling them. This does not mean that you should now be creating stories and just telling them stuff, you know, to try to get the job. But they're not as worried about you. And that's good because now they're actually paying attention to you. You have established your credibility to them. Another thing is questions you want to ask. Have you ever left an interview and said, gosh, I wanted to ask that question and I forgot. Now you can have them with you. And you can either write them in the notebook that you have, the little eight and a half by 11 notebook on the side, or you can put them in with one of the tabs. Then there's company research. Oh my gosh, that is so great to have with you when you have some good stuff you can show them. Now, if there's bad stuff, I don't know that I put that in my portfolio. Um, but you might want to ask some questions depending upon what it is, if that makes you question the organization. But as far as company research, say something that you saw in the Kansas City Business Journal or information you saw online about a new product they're launching or whatever, you could have that in there and refer to it and say, I noticed in here I have the article. That would be impressive to them. Wow, somebody who did more research on us than going to our company website and clicking on the career section. They are interview attention getters. Most of the time, people won't have them, so therefore the person that does gets the positive attention. It sets you apart from other people, and that's what you want to do. And it sets you apart in a good way. It also makes sure you're documenting your stuff. <laughs> Here's the problem. people think I'll be able to find things when I need them. Have you ever lost your keys? If you've lost your keys, you're going to lose other stuff. So try finding them at the last moment when you need a performance review, you want to find your degree, all this kind of stuff, and it's not sitting up on a wall for you to go grab. If you haven't put it in the files ahead of time, you're not going to find it. And people say, well, I'll copy that on, put it on my computer. That's great too, and I'm fine with that. But you also want to be able to find the things that you need to have in paper copy. Every once in a while, you will actually have a company say to you the following, bring your degrees with you, the real degrees, not copies. I know that sounds weird, but I've had many a client who's had that happen to them. Because the number one thing people lie about in an interview and on their resume is that they have a degree when they don't. It also helps you in interview prep. If you're putting all this together and you're doing your challenge action and result examples and everything, you have just done a ton of interview prep and it's wonderful. And the great thing about those car examples is that you don't have to do them all today. In fact, don't do that. It, they'll be terrible. Five a day, 10 days, boom, you got great examples. Because some of the things you're not gonna think of right away, you're gonna need some time to consider them or what example you wanna use. This is giving your brain time to catch up and give you extra examples. We're not gonna use anything that's generic when we create them. We're gonna use specific points in time of when we handled a disagreement that happened with a client, with a coworker, and it came out on the positive end. We're going to specifically get into information on a project without, of course, giving away proprietary stuff. All of those kinds of things happen but they can't happen as a specific if you're just trying to give generalities. For instance, I had a client who asked everybody at an interview she was doing, tell me about a time you worked effectively in a group. Not one of the people answered the question. Instead, they talked about how much they loved groups and that groups were wonderful and they were a people person and all that stuff, but not one person gave an actual example of them working effectively in a group. This gives you time to create some of these examples with that specificity in them, and then you wanna be careful and listen to their questions. It's a good networking tool. You can take it to that networking lunch. You can take it to that networking program that you're going to. You can even have it in front of you. People go, well, you know, a lot of things are online right now. Have it in front of you. You might forget to mention something, but because you got the portfolio in front of you, you remembered it. You might even show somebody here, I have a portfolio of my work. Then the other thing that I tell people that you want to be careful of is what you do and don't put online. Remember what I said earlier, LinkedIn is essentially your online portfolio. 
unless you're an artist or a writer or somebody who does some very specialized work that would require you to have your own website, almost like your own side business or whatever, or to show examples of things, I would not, and I mean I would not, just go and put together a whole nother website for that. It's a lot of additional information that's much easier to get a hold of. You can choose what's public and what's not on LinkedIn. You kind of can't on your website unless you want to give people passwords to it, and that annoys people when you do that. It will positively influence your ability to negotiate things. It's huge when you prove you are the person that they're wanting for that job, that you have extra things that you can provide to them from the periphery of your skill set. That often gets you more money or that extra week of vacation or other things that you're looking for. So if you can use that to your advantage, why wouldn't you? And never give it to them on a disc. If you give it to them on a disc, you've lost control of it. They now have it. And I can't tell you how many people who have had their resume stolen by somebody at a workplace and it was one of my colleagues or myself and we we knew we wrote it and somebody came to us with our work and went, you know, and you're like, oh, I even remember the client I did that for. And now they're admitting to you they lied and that, oh yes, they copied it from somebody else's stuff. Don't give your information away control what you have out there and control what you give to people. So what questions do you have now about the portfolio? Let's see. Old reference letters are great combined with new reference letters. So that's a great question. I like the idea of having both if you've got them because it shows, hey, 10 years ago, I was a great worker. Today, I'm a great worker. Why would you not show them that? Where can you print labels for the leave behind envelopes? Okay, so that is something that you can do on your printer and your printer actually has, or, or actually within your information under Microsoft Word, it will have something that will say envelopes and labels. And envelopes and labels, under labels, there's this list if you go into your options of all these different label types. All you're doing is matching it up. This is an Avery label, or this is a label from Microsoft, or this is a label from Office Depot or whatever. And you just tell it, you match up the number and boom, or match up the dimensions. Because it's going to be the same. If it's the dimensions, that's fine too. And now you can match it up. And the basic items to put in a leave behind envelope are that resume and your cover letter and your reference listing. If you have reference letters or recommendations from LinkedIn that you can add to it, that's great. If not, those three things are what you always want in it. The resume and cover letter that you gave to that company and the reference listing. Because really, the company shouldn't be asking for your references, even though some of them do it, before they ever, and I mean, before they ever even interviewed you. That just bothers the heck out of me, and I don't know why they feel the need to do it. Um, the Problem is, is you don't know anything about that company from an interview perspective yet. You haven't talked to them in that context. And they're already asking you, hey, let us call a bunch of people who know you. I would say that that's, that's kind of problematic. I wouldn't not apply for a job if I saw that, but that I question that. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And thank you, Karen, for all this fantastic information. Our next career and finance presentation will take place Monday. June 1st at 6.30 p.m. and will be focused on the art of interviewing. That June 1 program will feature Efren Mojica from All About You Consulting. More career and finance programs are listed at www.jocolibrary.org slash events slash career dash finance. Also, be sure to follow the library's Facebook page, facebook.com slash jocolibrary, to receive notifications for additional live online Johnson County Library programming for all ages. Thank y'all so much.